All right, so, uh, so far what we've done this school year, we have learned derivatives, right? You've learned how to apply them, how to find maxes, mids, when an object's moving to the right, to the left, up, down, what their velocities are. We talked about speed, we talked about uh, concavity, inflection points, you know, all of those things meant something. This here starts the second half of the year. Chapter six, seven, and eight is what we have left to do. We'll get those done hopefully by spring break. Okay, we don't have to do all of the sections. But now we're gonna kind of switch and go backwards. Okay, you learned how to take derivatives before. Now we're going to learn how to undo the derivatives, and that's what integrals are about. All right, but also learning along the way what are they good for. Just like before, the other told us about the speed, the velocity, you know, different things like that. What is this going to tell us? So today's kind of shows you a little bit about that. You're not going to make the connection yet with an integral or with a derivative, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, it, it will grow as, as we keep moving along here. Um, today what we're going to do is um, a skill that is learning to estimate with a finite sum. Now there are finite sums and there are infinite sums. Finite sums means you know how many things you're adding. Infinite sums means you don't know. You're adding up an infinite number of things. We'll do both of those, but today it's finite sums. Okay. Today we're going to talk about how to find the distance traveled of you know, a train going down the track for so many hours. We're going to apply it to an area and figure out using an area how it is that we can find the distance traveled. You're going to learn a method today called the rectangular approximation method, which we just call RAM because who wants to say rectangular approximation method many times? Notice the middle word though, approximation. It's not an exact, it is an approximation. There are times we cannot find an exact answer but we can find something pretty close to it. We'll use rectangles to find the area. We will be using rectangles, trapezoids, you know, to find areas of different sections, even though there's a curved edge to it. And so that's part of what we talk about today. Tomorrow then we'll move on to, or not tomorrow, Monday, we'll move on to the volume of a sphere, um, and then how it's applied with a cardiac problem. Um, my youngest daughter in February of last year had her second heart surgery. And being the mom of a child that has heart problems, it's important for me to understand. And it eases my mind to understand that when I go into a doctor's office and they start talking, I understand what they're talking about because I understand the math behind it. I understand the language behind it. But it also allows me to ask some very educated questions. You don't know how many people ask me, are you a nurse? Because of the questions that I ask, because of my math background and understanding some of those things. You know, so um, did I ever think I would need to use that in my life other than teaching it? No, <laughs> you know, to me, this is someone who works in a cardiac unit you know, a cardiologist or a nurse that works with, you know, heart patients would maybe need to understand that. I understand the math behind it. Never thought I'd have to really, truly, like that it would have meaning in my life. But that's what all of you are at right now. You don't know your futures at this point. You don't know, many of you don't know what you want to do, what you want to be, and that's why you're in here. You're in here just continuing to learn so that you have more choices in what you want to be um, in your future. But again, I will tell you, always pick something that's going to make you happy, number one, you know, as you're making your choices. All right, so in this section, the first problem says, a train moves along a track at a steady rate of 75 miles per hour from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. What is the total distance traveled by the train? You don't need calculus to get this problem, okay? The very first, one of the very first formulas that was ever given to you back in like fifth and sixth grade is this formula, distance equals rate times time. That's the 
only formula you need to do this problem. In order to find the distance, I take the rate of 75 miles per hour and I multiply it by how much time I'm traveling. I'm traveling from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., so from two hours. The hours reduce. 75 times 2 is 150 miles. So the distance that this train will have traveled in that two hours is 150 miles. Okay. What I would like to do with that, because I know you understand that and you're fine with that answer, but now let me kind of apply it to how we need to use it in calculus. In calculus, our problems are not usually that cut and dry. Okay. But let's put it how we're going to look at it calculus-wise. We could take a, a velocity time curve, and we could say the train is going a velocity of 75 miles per hour, and they said it was, if you remember this, a steady rate. That means the same rate, 75 miles per hour. And then down here I have the time from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. So I have myself a rectangle right in here that this side of the rectangle is two units, and this side of the rectangle is 75 units. And to find the area of this rectangle, I take length times width, or two times 75, which is 150. You can take these two labels, miles per hour and hours, and multiply them, and it will give you the label for them. Many times these labels help us in problems to understand, you know, what we're doing. So please feel free. If you don't know if there's a label, look at the graph. It might be hiding there on the graph for you instead of in the problem itself. But we just found the area. So if we know a particular graph and we know that it represents someone's distance traveled, if you just can find the area underneath that curve, between the curve and the x-axis, that is another way of finding the total distance traveled. Okay? So you got the same answer, right? So that's me just trying to get you to buy into it. Now let's talk about reality. Do trains always travel at a steady rate? Why not? Yeah. Not to turn. Say it again? They might have to like turn. They might have to turn. Okay. What else? They gotta stop at stations. They gotta stop at stations, pick people up, right? And then take some, they gotta speed up to get back up to that, slow back down to get down to that. What about when they come through the tracks right over on Portage? Do they go through at high speeds? Whenever they come to a crossing where cars might be crossing, they have to slow down. And so they can't stay at that steady rate in order to do that. But then sometimes they might be way out in the open when they're not going to have any of that, and they can maybe even pick up their speed and go faster. You know, So reality is, it's not probably going to happen that a train is going to go two hours at the same speed. Instead, it might be more like this. It speeds up, it slows down, and now I've got to find an area of that. So we need a method. And that's what the rectangular approximation method is. What we want to do is we want to break this thing up into rectangles. Okay? So one thing I could do is this. I could say, okay, here's a rectangle. Let's just find that area right there. That would be an estimate. But wouldn't it be an underestimate? Right? Because I'm leaving part of that blue off. All right, so instead, what if I do this? I'm going to make this my rectangle. It'd be an estimate, but it would be an overestimate, right? Because I'm including white space that isn't really a part of this. Everybody agree? All right, well, what if instead I decided to, like, maybe break it into multiple rectangles? Or multiple what look like rectangles like this and found the area of each of these rectangles where I just kind of cut off the tops like this it might still be an overestimate 
but it's not going to maybe be as much of an overestimate. You know, uh, where I could keep going like this, putting tops to these right here. Boop, 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 boop. And see how then there wouldn't be as much above it? Still an overestimate, but a better approximation than the big rectangle. The more rectangles that you can make in your picture, the more accurate your approximation is. It's still an approximation, all the more, but it's a closer approximation. Okay. So we need to talk about these rectangles. How do we decide how we're going to make these rectangles? So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to skip the next slide and come back to that. There are three different ways that we can make the rectangles. An AP is going to be specific as to which way they want you to do it. But these are the three types of rectangles that they could ask you for. RAM stands for Rectangle Approximation Method. But what we tend to do is put a letter on the front of it that helps us to decide what kind of rectangle we're going to have. They could put an L in the front of it. L stands for left. They could put an M in front of it. M stands for middle. They could put an R in front of it, which stands for right. L means the left corner of the rectangles are going to be touching the blue graph. See how the left corner of each of those is touching the blue graph? Whereas over here, the R is the right corner is going to be touching the graph. M is middle the middle of the rectangle is going to be touching the ground. The mid ram, the M ram, this is the most accurate, but usually the hardest mathematically to solve. So as this chapter goes on, we'll even talk about finding L ram and R ram and adding them together and dividing by two, you know, finding an average. Because is this one here an underestimate or an overestimate? What do you think? Under. under. See how there's space? It's, it's supposed to be all the area under the curve, and there's this space in here that's not counted in, right? And this one here is an overestimate. Now, that does not mean L ram is always an underestimate because it, it depends on the concavity. If it's concave up, then L ram is an underestimate. But if it's concave down, if it goes like this, L ram is going to be an overestimate. They kind of flip, these two do. So don't memorize in any way that L ram or R ram are always one or the other. Your best bet is to look at the picture to determine it, okay? Because concavity changes things. And then what if you have a picture that has part concave up and part concave down? Usually it's a wash then, you know? This one here, you can see that the rectangles go over top of the graph. And so that's an overestimate. But this one here, do you see how like this section right here is an underestimate, but this is an overestimate, all with the same rectangle? That's why this one is the most accurate. It's still an estimate. It is not exact. Okay, but it's better than the other two. Questions about those rectangles? All right, now let's go back to this one here. This one here says, a particle starts at x equals zero and moves along the x-axis with a velocity of t squared for a time, excuse me, time greater than or equal to zero. You can't have negative time, so it's always going to be the case. You have y equals t squared, which is this graph, but since time starts at zero, you have to kind of take that part away. They can't have negative time over it. This one right here is breaking this up into 12 rectangles. Notice they haven't finished off the top yet. If I wanted to do R ram for this and make these right rectangles, let me introduce now the subscript. There's usually a subscript with it that tells you how many rectangles to draw. So like AP will give you a problem. These will be on a non-calculator section, so get used to that. Um, for AP, they don't put them on the calculator section at all. And they'll tell you whether they want left, right, or middle, and they'll tell you how many rectangles. Okay, 
They don't always give you the graph. Sometimes they just give you the equation and you have to draw it. So you'll see some examples in a little bit with that. So our RAM 12 would look, start like this with these vertical lines. There's four of them for every one unit. But that means our RAM, I'm gonna, I like, for our RAM, I like to start at the right side and draw to the left. For L RAM, I like to start at the left and draw to the right. I start on that right corner and draw it over and down. Then there's that corner over and down, that corner over and down, that corner over and down, et cetera, going the whole way. Is this gonna be an overestimate or an underestimate? Over, good. And then that last one's kind of hard to see. All of that extra that I just drew in is all the overestimate. In order to find then this um, area, I would have to take the width of each one of these and multiply it by the height of each one. The width by the height, the width by the height, etc. This one's a very big problem. They're not going to give you one as big as this to do by hand. But some things to talk about. What is this width right here? A quarter. One fourth, right. You are better off writing it as a fraction than a decimal. The math will be easier for you if you do that. And aren't each of these one quarter of a unit wide? So if I take and I want to set this up, rather than finding length times width plus length times width times length times width, you know, like over and over, since all of them have this width of one fourth, I can just pull that to the front and add all the heights up. So this is like height one plus height two plus height three, all the way to the last one plus height 12. It'll save you some time rather than finding each one individually. Now, what about finding those heights? Okay, well, if I wanna know the height of this one, I would need to plug three into the equation. Three squared is nine. So this height is nine. 2.75 squared. Well, you don't know that one without a calculator, but what is 2.75 as a fraction? Isn't it 11 fourths? Square that, it's easier. 121 over 16, you know? So those are, just, we're not gonna like completely work through this problem, uh, but I wanted to kind of, you know, like point that out. It's easiest if you actually make a chart for these values. You know, so like you're gonna say, when x is three, y is nine. When x is 11 fourths, y is 121 16, et cetera. And you're gonna go all the way down to zero, zero. One fourth, 1 16. And you're gonna do all that, you know, from one end to the other. When you have it in a chart form, if the question is LRAM, you're going to use all of the Y values to the left, including that left one, but you're not going to use the very right one. For RRAM, you're going to use all of them to the right, but not that one. So you're going to leave one of them off. It's either the first one or the last one. If it's LRAM, you include the left. If it's RRAM, you include the right. And again, I'll show you this on a problem. You're not going to have one that you have to do that's that intense. Okay, but I'm just kind of giving you some features. This is the graph if I would have asked you M RAM. You see how those rectangles, the middle of each rectangle is on the blue graph? So part of it is being able to draw these. Part of it's, you know, being able to actually, um, you know, come up with answers for them. So. Here's another problem, which quite honestly, AP is not going to give you this one to do on the test. The reason is it's a calculator problem. And they're not going to give you a calculator problem, but I'm going to use it to show you something else. They have this where it's given that this is the graph of x squared sine x on the interval from 0 to 3. Estimate the area under the curve from 0 to 3. They'd have to be more specific for you, okay? They'd have to say LRAM, RRAM, MRAM. They would also have to put a little number as a, a subscript to say 
how many rectangles that you would want to draw. All right, so they have to be specific. You don't ever have to guess how many rectangles. They're going to tell you, okay? But instead, what I'm using this for is to show you, let's look at all three of them, and let's look at any number of rectangles. If they did LRAM, MRAM, or RRAM 5, with five rectangles, these would be the answers. You see how they're not the same. The guy in the middle is going to be your most accurate. You see how this is an underestimate and an overestimate. What if I did 10 rectangles? Well, the middle number even changes. This is more accurate than that one. The more rectangles you have, the more accurate it is. So if you have more rectangles than MRAM, that's the most accurate that you could get. So out of this entire chart, if I had 1,000 rectangles, the most accurate answer is this guy right here, 5.777. Okay, because I, I say three decimal places because this is AB, and that's what you have to give on an AP exam. LRAM with that would be 5.775. RRAM would be 5.779. Do you see how close these two numbers are to this? When you have more rectangles. But look at these. These are, this is 0.02 away. This one's 0.74 away, you know. So they, they kind of like get closer and closer to that middle number that's more accurate. So questions that AP likes to ask on the multiple choice is, what's the most accurate? Right now, you only have MRAM, LRAM, and RRAM. But in this, ch in this chapter, there's going to be more that come at you. We're going to be looking at trapezoids. Um, there's uh, a trapezoid rule. There's a Simpsons rule. There's, there's other rules that we're going to be looking at. This is just the start of it. Okay. So now, let's kind of go through some examples. You're going to have some examples with curves. You're going to have some examples that don't have curves. If they don't have curves, you're usually able to find an exact answer. If they have curves, that's when it's an estimated answer, okay? So the first one gives the velocity equation, V of t equals 2t plus 1 meters per second. Find the total distance traveled in the first two seconds. <laughs> Bless you. Mm -hmm. So think about the graph of this, because that's what we're doing today. We're finding the area under the curve. So let's look at the curve, okay? Well, it's not a curve, is it? It's a line. Isn't that y equals mx plus b? Right? So the slope is 2, and the y-intercept is 1. So it's crossing the y-axis at 1. It's going up 2 and to the right 1. And then it's going up 2 again and to the right 1. And this is the area that they're expecting me to find right there. That area is representing total distance. The area under a curve represents total distance. I want you to walk out of here today being able to say that. Area under a curve equals total distance. Okay? Now, that, my friends, is not a rectangle. But it doesn't have a curve. So that means I'm able to find an exact area right here. So I have some of you that look at this and say, that, my friends, is a trapezoid, because I remember geometry, and a trapezoid is when we have one set, at least one set of parallel sides. And then some of you are saying, you are crazy, woman. I would never think of that as a trapezoid. I would see it as a rectangle and a triangle. Okay. So how many of you would do the trapezoid? How many of you should? How many of you should be doing the trapezoid? All of your hands need to go up because soon you're going to have something called a trapezoid rule, and you've got to use a trapezoid. So it is in your best interest tonight, if it is a trapezoid, to try to use the trapezoid rule. Get used to it because it's coming. <laughs> okay. So let's let's review that from geometry. The formula for the area of a trapezoid that you were given back then was one half height times base one plus base two. 
the height is actually what they're referring to as the distance between the parallel sides. And the B's here are the length of the parallel sides. I know it's been a while since you've had geometry, so you know, I'll remind you as though you never knew it in the past, because maybe you did. I don't know. <laughs> right? You memorized it and then let it go. All right. So what is the distance between the parallel sides of this picture? Two. So that's your height. Now look at base one and base two. How tall is the first parallel side? One. How tall is the second parallel side? Five. So is that hard? Not at all. Okay. So half of two is one. One plus five is six. One plus six, or sorry, one times six is is six. And then six what? This is the total distance traveled. Meters, right? Again, look back through your problem. It's hiding there somewhere usually. Okay, now, here's the problem with this. What if it said in the first 20 seconds? And you didn't want to have to keep going up to right one, up to right one, up to <laughs> to figure out the height of that last one. You don't have to do that. All you needed were those first two points, okay? You can just take these x values where those parallel lines are and plug them into the equation. 0 plus 1 is 1. That gives us that one. And 2 times 2 is 4 plus 1 is 5 for that one. Okay? So don't think you have to, like, keep drawing it out that whole distance. You can find that just by putting the x values in. Okay? So the total distance traveled for this one is 6 meters. Notice no curves on this one. Exact answer. Okay. Next one. V of t equals t squared plus 2 meters per second. For the first 2.5 seconds, find L ram 5. So they're very specific. All right. So I start with a graph of t squared plus 2. It is crossing the y-axis at 2. Right? It's a parabola that just moves up two, but we don't have negative time, so we have to take that side away. So it's starting here at two, and it's going like this. And it's ending at 2.5. This here is 2.5 seconds. Now, the next thing I see is how many rectangles? I need to put vertical lines in here so that they're equally spread apart going over to 2.5. So how far, how, like what's the distance between each one is one thing that comes up, okay? So there is a little formula for finding this little height that we're talking about, this little distance. You can take B minus A over N. This is a formula that's in your book, B minus A over N. Where A and B are, this is going from 0 to 2.5, the left and right side of it. So this is B, or this is A and B right here. So 2.5 minus 0. And N down here is the number of rectangles that they've asked for. They've asked for five rectangles. <laughs> so this comes out to one half. So that means every one half unit, there's a new rectangle. Okay, let's see how close I can get here. Look pretty good. <coughs> Start drawing in these vertical lines to break it up into. Use that. It's kind of crooked right there. These rectangles. So now I got to finish off the top based on L ring. That is saying that the left side of the rectangle, and I'm going to start on the left side as I do it, it's going to come straight across right there. Now right here, it's going to come straight across. Now right here, it's going to come straight across. My left corner is the top of my rectangle. 
If it would have been R ram, I would have started on the right side drawing out this way. Okay. Is this going to be an underestimate or an overestimate? It's going to be an underestimate. Okay. Now, remember how I mentioned a chart? Here's what I would do for this chart. Okay. T is going to be my X values that I have here. I have these X values that I'm going to leave in fraction form. Please believe me, it's way easier than decimals, okay? I'm going to put all of those X values in my chart. Zero, one half, one, three halves, two, and five halves. To find the y values, I just plug them into this. I don't have to look at the graph to guess. 0 squared plus 2 is 2. 1 half squared is 1 fourth. Plus 2 is 5 fourths or 2 and 1 fourth. 1 squared is 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 half squared, square the top, square the bottom. 9 fourths plus 2. 9 fourths plus 2 is like 9 fourths plus 8 fourths, so 17 fourths. Plug the 2 in. 4 plus 2 is 6. And then plug the 5 halves in. I get 25 fourths plus 2 is 25 fourths plus uh, 8 fourths, which is 33 fourths. Okay, now, L Ram says left. Count all of these Y values to the left, but leave off the light one. If it was R Ram, I'd do all of these, including the right one, and I would leave off that last one over there. Okay? So um, it, it just depends on how they have it. So now from there, these are all of the heights of each of these rectangles. What's that? Did I do something wrong? Two squared is four. Four plus two. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Hey, I make a mistake, so don't be afraid to ever point that out. All right. So now what I do is I take, in order to find this area, I take the width of each rectangle, which is one half, and then I multiply it by the sum of all of these over here. 2 plus 5 fourths plus 3 plus 17 fourths plus 6. Because what you're doing is you're saying the length times the width of the first one is that, the length times the width of the second one is that, the length times the width of the third one times the width, you know. It saves you time, though, to write that width just once. So we have 1 half. Now let's see. 2 plus 3 plus uh, 6 is 11. 5 fourths plus 17 fourths is 20. 2 fourths, 22 fourths is 11 halves. I probably changed that to 22 halves right there. Because remember, this is going to be on the non calculator. So that's 33 halves times 1 half, which is 33 fourths. Sorry, my fourths do so. 33 fourths. Now, do they give me a label? I think that was meters. Yeah, meters. Um, is, the, is one half wrong? Is one half wrong? This one? Right here? Yeah. Okay, let's see. One half squared is one fourth plus two. Eight fourths, nine fourths. Yes, it is. Thank you. This is nine fourths. Which that's going to change this down here to a nine. Oh. That's 26 fourths, which is 13 halves, which is 35 halves, which is 35 fourths. One through eight and number 10. There you have it. Okay. 
35 fourths. All right, this last example here, MRAM 4. This here happens to be a parabola that's moved down 4. And go something like that, but this side doesn't count. And it's asking from a time of 2 to 10. Now, when does it hit the x-axis? It hits the x-axis at 2. So it's asking about this side over here um, from 2 to 10. You don't really have to have the graph in order to find that area. You can just take and draw out the chart. You're going to start with 2. They want MRAM 4. So if you want to know how wide they are, you take B minus A, which is 10 minus 2, divided by N. That gives you 8 over 4, which is 2. So every 2 units. So add 2 to this. And keep adding 2 until you get to this last number that you see. Plug them in to find each value. 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. 16 minus 4 is 12. 36 minus 4 is 32. 64 minus 4 is 60. And 100 minus 4 is 96. Then for MRAM, oh, well, I need a new chart for MRAM. This chart would be for LRAM. You use these. Our RAM, you're going to use this. But when you're talking about MRAM, now you have to take and find the values in between. What's in the middle of 2 and 4 here would be 3. In the middle of 4 and 6 would be 5. 6 and 8 would be 7. And 8 and 10 would be 9. And now find the Y values for that, plugging them in up here. So I have 9 minus 4, which is 5. 25 minus 4 is 21. 49 minus 4 is 45. 81 minus 4 is 77. And now from there, when it's an MRAM problem, you're going to use all four of these numbers. So the distance between my x's is 2, and then add each of the heights together to get the height of each rectangle that you're so let's see, this is 26, and 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, just 2 times 148, which is 296. I think that was in meters up at the beginning. All right, so for homework, you have 1 through 8 and number 10.